You're welcome back. This is News for Alice, your most authoritative news analysis show. I'm Samson Ayanini. And um, by way of my take, very briefly this morning, I want us to take a peek into the chambers of the uh, Supreme Court of Ghana. And I dedicate this to um, Carl Kwame Adongo, who is being uh, laid to rest uh, today. May his soul rest in perfect peace. He was um, such a very affable uh, senior, very generous with his uh, knowledge that he acquired. Uh, he is a lawyer I had a lot of respect for, and he just left us in suddenly, in such a sudden manner. I understand that most of my colleagues, uh, particularly uh, Tadio Sorry's law firm and uh, associates, are all in Bolgatanga this morning. We wish him a very uh, safe journey. Well, Going to the Supreme Court chambers, uh, I want us to, to learn just a bit about how the court goes about making its judgments. When the hearing is over, all the people come give their facts and everything. All the arguments canvassed by both sides are over. The president of the panel, there's always one who presides over the particular panel. The president of the panel convenes a judgment conference at which the particular panel, members of that panel, deliberate on the outcome of the case, individual opinions and reasons for those opinions are heard. It may start from the most junior to the most senior on the panel, and we understand, according to uh, Justice Dateba, uh, doctor, uh, retired, that this is done in that manner so as to avoid seniors dominating the debate. So the most junior begins to give his opinion, then it continues in ascending order until the very final person who will be the most senior gives his uh, opinion on the case. There is room for exchange of views in the light of the discussions that go on. Individual draft judgments May, be, may have been circulated ahead of the conference. So each judge may have written their own draft judgment and circulated ahead of the conference. Some presiding judges prefer judges attending the conference to come without any fixed views. So it makes it easier for one to modify his initial views of a case. A decision is then reached to have a unanimous judgment, that is if they all agree, or if there is not a unanimous agreement, then the rest follows. There may be concurring opinion, as in this present case we have. We have uh, Justice uh, uh, Benin giving a concurring view, and which is actually in support of the main view as well. So there may be concurring opinion or a dissenting one to a lead judgment. Concurring uh, opinions do not reach different conclusions as the majority decision, uh, uh, as the majority decision, while the dissenting opinions will normally reach a different conclusion from the majority. If they are divided, there will be the majority and minority opinions with each writing their separate decisions sometimes like in the presidential elections, each judge wrote their uh, decision. But all will be compiled by the registra registrar into a composite judgment of the court signed by all the judges. So that's uh, by way of some bit of education about what happens in the chambers of the Supreme Court when they are done with a case. Now I have a question. Where there is a unanimous judgment, like in the Abu Ramadan case that is uh, topping <laughs> the charts now. Since it is the case that what the panel of the court means is usually agreed at the judgment conference or judgment conferences, will it not be bizarrely confounding to have the panel members express different understandings of their unanimous judgment? That is by way of my take this morning. Thank you very much for joining us. As always, this is News File. It's your most authoritative news analysis show. 
And I begin the very first segment with a very special guest this morning in the person of Dr. Raymond Atuguba, his senior lecturer, University of Ghana School of Law. And uh, thank you very much for joining us, Doc. Thank you, Samson. It's very me. great to have you here. Uh, we've been chasing you for quite a very long time. How difficult it is to get you into these studios. <laughs> and somehow, coincidentally, you seem to have brought yourself because you wrote this very tall article uh, that uh, had to be done with a first chapter and a second chapter in the Daily Graphic. And then here you are. Thank you very much once again. Good. Now, let, let's start with basics. Let's start with basics. Um, you, you really haven't done this thing in a long time. You have taken your time to write an article, such a very tall one. What was the motivation? Um, thanks, Samson. The reason why I wrote the article and the reason why I allowed you to bully me to come here today <laughs> is, is really simple. One, I think the Ghanaian public needs to be assisted to understand the judgment of the Supreme Court in the recent Abu Ramadan case. Um, it's not everyone who's a lawyer, but everyone is interested and invested in our democracy. Mm. So I think lawyers must assist non-lawyers, understand the true meaning of the judgment. This is important because the judgment has implications for every Ghanaian's right to vote. It has implications for the right of a Ghanaian to insist that someone who is not qualified to vote should, be, should have his or her name taken from the register and not be allowed to vote. Mm -hmm. It has implications for the right of Ghanaians to go to the polls in November or December with a credible register. It has implications for the validity of the 2016 polls in general. Mm -hmm. And it has implications for any challenge to the polls that might occur after the election. So it's an incredibly important case, and it is critical that we come to an agreed understanding of what the judges said and what the judges did not say mm. on, on the 5th of May 2016. You talk about it will be important to come to an agreed understanding. It's very obvious we will not. Why is it so? And uh, I mean, some coincidentally, uh, in, the, in, the graphic, in the graphic of um, the 24th, in the graphic of the 24th, I wrote this article titled Abu Ramadan versus EC, which is the problem, the judgments its interpretation or both. And uh, that was on the page uh, 38. And then on page uh, 43, yours is also there. The Supreme Court uh, Voters Register and NHIS Cards, part one. What is it? Is it we who are confusing ourselves with the interpretation, or it is that the interpretation, the judgment itself, is difficult to interpret, or it's not clear? Uh, so the judgment is very, very clear. Interesting. But Ghanaians, or a section of Ghanaians, are trying to fit the judgment into their own idiosyncrasies. So if someone believes that everyone who's name is in the register by virtue of an NHIA card, should be out of it. They try to fit the judgment that way. And anyone who believes that those people should not be disenfranchised, try to fit the judgment that way. What I'm tr trying to do today is to give a strict legal implication, a, tr a strict legal interpretation of what the judgment means. Mm. And then you can take that and then do your politics with it, whichever way you want to do it. So we're trying to st stay strictly legal on this. Right. Yeah. But you raised five key points, yeah. which you said were misinformation or wrong information put out there in the public. Yes. And you set out to correct those impressions. Yeah. And I find that you actually didn't make much commentary. What you did was simply copy 
portions of the judgment and just you know put it out there for the public. Okay. But you, your number one m uh, impression or misinterpretation you say or wrong interpretation that's been put out in the public, you say that it is the case that people are saying the plaintiffs won their case. That is Abu Ramadan and Evans Nemako, they won their case. Um, you say you come to discuss that and you make the emphatic conclusion that they did not. They lost their case entirely. How can that be true? Well, as you rightly said, in my approach, I decided to let the Supreme Court speak for itself rather than speaking for the Supreme Court. Right. So I set out the six conclusions from the judgment. And under each conclusion, I just simply cut and pasted the very words of the Supreme Court in support of each of the six conclusions. So that you can't say that it's Raymond saying these are the six conclusions. So demonstrate that, that they lost the case. OK, so one, the plaintiffs lost the case because all the substantive claims that they brought to the court were dismissed. And Samson, if your case is dismissed in substance, how on earth can you say you won the case? They have four reliefs, correct? Out of the Depending four reliefs, on how you count. three of them were granted. It, depends. it was the fourth relief, mm -hmm. which had a, a, a subset, B and A, mm -hmm. that was dismissed. So Samson, you are counting the reliefs in a particular manner. Let me take you through what I have. Mm -hmm. First, the plaintiffs wanted the Supreme Court to declare that the current voters' register is unconstitutional, null and void, and therefore of no effect. The Supreme Court declared that the current voters' register is constitutional. Would you say that they won that point? Of course not. Okay. The plaintiffs also wanted the Supreme Court to declare that based on the previous judgment in 2014, all persons who got onto the voters register by using a national health identification card as a means of identification were not validly on the register and were automatically to be deleted from the register. This is because their interpretation of that judgment was that the use of those ID cards was void. And as a lawyer, you know that once it is void, it is as if it did not exist. Correct. In other words, although the names of the NHIA registrants are on the register, in fact, in law, de jure, they are not. The Supreme Court refused to accede to that claim. In fact, the Supreme Court overruled their previous decision in Abu Ramadan. In that previous decision, they said that the use of the NHIA card as a means of identification made the registration void. In this case, decided on the 5th of May, they said the use of the NHIA card was voidable. In other words, in their own words, at the time that the people who registered with NHIA cards registered, that registration was legal and valid. And it was not of their own doing that they registered. They said so. Yes. They further said that taking off their names when they had validly registered at that time was unconstitutional. Because you'll be depriving them of what? The right to vote. And so, in cleaning the register, at any point that you take out someone's name for being invalidly on the register, you have to immediately provide that person an opportunity to register again if that person is qualified or if that person is not there. So again, on that critical ground of holding that the NHA card, uh, uh, card NHA registration cards. was void, they lost because the Supreme Court in effect said it is voidable. If it is void, it means that all the names are automatically deleted 
And although they are on the register, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. they are not on the register as a matter of law. So to say that those names should not be held to be absent from the register, the Supreme Court had, in accordance with Article 1293 of the Constitution, which gives them power to depart from their previous decisions, the Supreme Court had restated their position and impliedly overruled their Ramadan case number one. So on that point, they lost. The third substantive claim the plaintiffs went to the Supreme Court with was for the Supreme Court to order the Electoral Commission to automatically delete the names. In other words, if we can't get it declared void, then the EC, without more, should delete those names. Again, the Supreme Court said, no, we cannot do that. All we can do is to tell the Electoral Commission to delete those names together with all other names that should not be on the register according to constitutional and legal means. You cannot tell the Electoral Commission, hold all names in this category void or delete all names in this category. Because again, you'll be infringing on people's rights to vote. Mm. And then you are moving to the, to the last I'm moving today. to the next one, uh, the last two. Okay. The, the plaintiffs again asked the Supreme Court to order the Electoral Commission to validate the register. Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court was again very clear. We cannot order the Electoral Commission to validate the, the register whatever that means. In fact, it went on to say that to order the Electoral Commission to validate the register would be an illegality because the process of validation is unknown to the laws of Ghana. And finally, the Supreme Court said, look, we are dealing here with the constitutional body, the Electoral Commission. Remember, these judges are smart. They know that if they descend into an arena where on every day they have to tell the Electoral Commission and all other constitutional bodies how to do their works, they will die because they can't shoulder that burden. The reason why those institutions are constitutionally made independent is that they are given a charge and expected to execute it independently, save for very critical interventions by the courts. Mm -hmm. What the Supreme Court was telling the plaintiffs in this case is that this intervention is not as critical as you think it. Okay. And so we are going to tell the Electoral Commission, go back and independently do what you are supposed to do. Right. Now, for each of the four that you have referred to. Six, actually. Six that you have referred to. Yes. There are actually four in six because the fourth contains mm. two. Yes. Now. This is what the court said, and yeah. I, want to, I want to read that. Yes. And I want to ask again how you can make the emphatic conclusion mm -hmm. that they lost. Okay. The court said, that's uh, page 23, uh, 32. Mm -hmm. The result is that we proceed to grant the following reliefs. We proceed to give you these things you ask for that upon a true and proper interpretation of Article 42A of the Constitution, the mandate of the Electoral Commission to compile the register of voters implies a duty to compile a reasonably accurate and credible register. And those words are important, reasonably accurate and credible. So they asked for that, they got that. Number two, a declaration that the current register of voters, it's important to note, current register of voters, which contains names of persons who have not established qualification to be registered, is reasonably, is not reasonably accurate or credible. And over here, current register, persons who have not established qualification, is also important, leading to the register being not reasonably accurate or credible. They got that. Three, 
a declaration that the current register of voters, which contains the names of persons who are diseased, is not reasonably accurate or credible. So they got all these three. Can you say again that they lost their case? So, Samson, this is, I think, where many people are going astray. The orders, the judgment, final judgment done, made by the Supreme Court mm. is divisible into two parts. Declaratory reliefs and substantive reliefs. Okay. You can get a hundred declaratory reliefs. But if in substance that does not lead to actual orders for someone to do something which inures to your benefit, then you've really achieved nothing. So you can count a hundred declaratory reliefs that the voters register is not correct. We all know that. Okay? That it contains the names of dead people. We know that. That it contains you can make all those declaratory judgments, but what do you get in substance? Is what we are concerned about. Ghanaians are not concerned about what they know. Ghanaians are concerned about what do they do not know and are listening to the Supreme Court for direction on. And what I'm saying is that on the matters that are of concern to the Ghanaian, mm. not the declaratory judgments, but the substantive reliefs, the plaintiffs got 0% of their substantive reliefs and cannot be said to have won their case. Is it not instructive okay. that even when the, the concurring opinion was being rendered mm -hmm. by Justice Benny, yeah. he spoke about the suit having been dismissed, mm -hmm. but he qualifies it. Mm -hmm. You don't want to qualify it. He qualifies it that it is dismissed to the extent mm -hmm to the extent mm -hmm. of the fourth relief, which is to compel the EC or to declare the register as uh, invalid and consequentially to compel the EC to compile a new one. At page 44 to 45 mm -hmm. of the judgment, this is what Justice Benning says. Right. And Justice Benning is giving a concurring judgment. Right. And in legal jurisprudence, the purpose of a concurring judgment is to further clarify points made in the main judgment. As you said at the beginning, a judge who writes a concurring judgment would have read the majority or dissenting opinion already and then write his own judgment in further clarification of the position. But comes and to that's why the same conclusion. Comes to the same conclusion. Quote, he says, I fully agree with the decision reached in this case that the plaintiff's action be dismissed insofar as it seeks to order, it seeks an order to compel the first defendant to compile a fresh voter's register or to use the validation process to clean the existing register. And I said again, that is instructive. Again, Samson, what Justice Benin, in fact, is saying is that the court has dismissed all the substantive reliefs. He says, in of, so far as. Yes. And he goes on after that to list the substantive reliefs that the plaintiffs came to court for. Unless we distinguish between declaratory reliefs and substantive reliefs, we will continue to be misled about the interpretation of this case. A declaratory relief is like a policy statement that, and we have in Ghana, 99.9% .9 of our policies remain unimplemented. That is because they haven't been translated into concrete law and concrete reg regulations. So you can decide to remain in the policy realm where 99.9% .9 of what you have is not implementable, or you descend into the substantive realm where what you want done may or may not be done. And if, what I'm saying if, is if that... If what you are saying is correct, mm -hmm. <clears throat> then your, your initial submission about the implications of this judgment is questionable. 
because your initial submissions included that the judgment has implications for the right to vote. Yes. It has implications um, of the, for their right to prevent someone who is not qualified to vote from yep. voting. You actually went further to say it has implications including the validity of the elections and after the election, a possible challenge of the elections. But again, Samson, you're making another mistake which the discussions on this case have made. There's a difference between the importance of the judgment and the categorization of the plaintiffs as having won or lost. What I'm saying is that this judgment is incredibly important mm -hmm. because it seeks to clarify who can vote it would be inconsequential if they mm -hmm. lost. That's not true. You can lose a case, and the judge or judges would make very substantive statements of law in that case which you lost. The two are completely different. You get what I mean? OK. So, so, in, so, in, so can we move to the next issue about okay. non, um, no order for automatic deletions? No order for automatic deletions. because. Um, the premises that you raise uh, to start with, you have listed all of them. The premises we spoke about, you said that the plaintiffs uh, did not win their case and that people have said they have won and that, that was incorrect. You said that the Supreme Court has uh, declared the register of voters unconstitutional, null and void. That was wrong for people to say that. You said it was wrong for people to say the Supreme Court has, by its judgment, deleted the names of all persons on the voter register, who registered with the National Health Insurance uh, Card. And uh, fourthly, that the Supreme Court has ordered the Electoral Commission to automatically delete names of all persons on the voter's register who registered with the NHIS card but as means of identification. And finally, the Supreme Court has ordered the Electoral Commission to validate the, the uh, voter's register. You say all of these claims are wrong. And I suggest to you that with the exception of your fourth ground, mm -hmm. which is that the Supreme Court has ordered the Electoral Commission to automatically delete the names of all persons on the voters' register who registered with NHIS cards. With the exception of that ground, the first issue about the fact that plaintiffs have won their case, the second issue about the fact that the, the courts had declared the voters' register unconstitutional, null and void, the third issue about the Supreme Court um, has by a judgment deleted the names of NHIS cardholders, and the fourth one about validation, were really no controversies that existed. These were your creation. No, the Samson. only controversy was about the deletion and how. No, Samson, that's, again, that's a misreading of the reliefs the plaintiff sought and the judgment the court gave. Mm. You can read out the reliefs again. The plaintiffs went to court attempting to set aside the entire voters' register and for a new register to be compiled. Mm -hmm. In the alternative, they were seeking a process of validation of the register. Right. So they went to court saying, Supreme Court, declare this register unconstitutional, null and void, and of no effect. And if you can't do that, order the Electoral Commission to validate the register. So the Supreme Court could have ruled that we agree with the plaintiffs. The current voter register is unconstitutional, null and void, and therefore of no effect. And the Electoral Commission no, would have had you, to you, start. You raise these grounds, and you say that uh, among these utterly wrong interpretations are the following. And you listed these are the, as the interpretations. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying all of these are grounds that you are raising yourself, except the fourth, which is actually an issue in controversy, which is automatic deletion or how deletion should be done. So uh, that in the public, there was any claim that the Supreme Court has ordered the EC to validate the register 
uh, whether there was any claim that the Supreme Court had declared the register unconstitutional, null and void. These did not exist. Uh, so what you're saying is that mm. these were, you agree that these were issues before the court, but you don't agree that they are currently controversial. Certainly they are not. Oh, no, that, that's not true. All these issues I've raised are taken from the media reports about the case. The reason why I raised the first issue mm. on whether the plaintiff has lost or won is because the plaintiffs went to on, on, on air saying, we won our case. And that's why it's an issue. Because think about my auntie in the village hearing Abu Ramadan, he's my friend by the way, saying, we won our case. Once Abu Ramadan tells people that he's won their, his case, what people would hear is that the voter's register has been declared unconstitutional and that a new voter's register has to be compiled or the no, voter's but, register no, the has to be validated. The, the reporting was very clear. The reporting was straight to the point that <laughs> ineligible names <laughs> ought to be taken out of the, struck out of the register, minus dead people. Uh, foreigners and the controversial one is NHIS card holders if they were to be deleted how did they do they get back onto the register something we're trying to do a public service right we are trying to get the people of Ghana to understand what the Supreme Court actually said correct and thereby orient their actions between now and post elections mm -hmm. In that manner. Correct. What I'm saying is that if a plaintiff who has lost their case is aided by the media, I do to not tell, share that view though personally. To that, tell that Ghanaians, they lost their case. to tell Ghanaians yeah. mm -hmm. that they won their case, Ghanaians may start thinking that the substantive orders they went to court for have been granted, mm. and therefore the voters register has either been declared unconstitutional, null and void, and a new one has to be compiled, or the Supreme Court has ordered that register to be validated. Okay. None uh, of this is true. Okay. I think we can, we can move on to another point, but it is, it is also important to say that to the extent that even the concurring opinion begins on a note of qualifying how much loss has been incurred by the plaintiffs, it cannot be that the plaintiffs lost their case, even though if they did not win, they got something. Now, you, you say that the court did not order automatic deletion of the names. What do you mean by it did not order automatic deletion of the names? So, of persons who registered with NHIS card, correct? So, first thing is that the court ordered that the register should be cleaned. And by cleaning, the court meant that people whose names should not be on the register should be taken out. Right. The court did not order that they should be automatically taken out. And the court did not order that they should be struck down by the court. So let's be clear on this. The Supreme Court could have, by, on its own, struck out the names of all persons who do not qualify to vote. They have the power to do that. They declined to do that. The Supreme Court could have ordered the Electoral Commission to automatically take out all the names of all the people who shouldn't be on the register. The Supreme Court declined to do that. The reason why they declined to do that are two. First, it is inappropriate for a court of law to over meddle in the internal functioning of an independent constitutional body. It is not only inappropriate it is impracticable for the Supreme Court to watch over the functioning of the Electoral Commission on a day-by-day -day basis 
And so the judges, the, the wise judges know that they can't make such an order. No, but they were, they were clear. The second... That if... The second if, reason... If, if you went wrong, Thompson. they had the powers. By, by the powers granted them through judicial review, if you went wrong, they could correct you and order you accordingly. Yeah, Thompson, mm. again, you are mixing things up. The fact that the Supreme Court has the power to do something doesn't mean that they will do it. And this is all strewn up in the law reports. And that's why judicial discretion is so important. Mm. In the exercise of their discretion, in this case, mm. the Supreme Court decided that one, they were not going to order that all those names stand automatically deleted because that would affect the right to vote of several Ghanaians. Right. So you agree first. And two. You agree first that they said that the continued presence of those names on the register mm -hmm. rendered the register not reasonably accurate or credible. You agree? They, they made that declaration. But sufficient mm. and constitutional. Right. But they said to the extent, no, to the extent that mm -hmm. those names, uh, people who registered with NHIS cards, who had been declared unconstitutional, the cards which had been declared unconstitutional earlier, their continued presence on the register rendered the register not reasonably accurate and not reasonably uh, and not credible. You agree that they made Samson, that point? Samson. Now? No, no, Samson, wait. Yes. As lawyers, mm. we are not politicians interested in credibility and accuracy. Politicians are interested in the credibility and accuracy of the voters' register. In this legal analysis, mm -hmm. we are interested in the constitutionality and voidness of the register. These two no, are but, different. But, but they, 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 they started from a point to a point. Yes. Something. The elections can be run on a register that is not credible and that is not accurate. Seriously? In fact, 99% of registers all over the world, as John ben Benjamin has told us, are not credible and not accurate. It is impossible to register millions and millions of voters so and that, get an so accurate that the register. the ultimate orders of the Supreme Court were needless. That is why you have to distinguish between credibility and accuracy, which is a hope, a wish, an aspiration we okay. work towards. If I can get you to, to, and to directly respond to that. Constitutionality mm -hmm. and voidness. Mm. And this is again another big misconception in the analysis. The, cons the Supreme Court said the voters' register is not credible and not accurate. But they refused to say that that non-credibility and non-accuracy made the register unconstitutional and void. But they in said, other words... But they said that because their continued presence on the register renders the register not reasonably accurate or credible, what ought to be done to them was to have them deleted through a process established by law. Exactly. In other words, they should not be deleted so, automatically. So they acknowledge, contrary to what you suggest, uh -huh. that the inaccuracy uh -huh. and the lack of credibility of the, of the register uh -huh. is a serious matter and ought to be purged. Something. Let's be careful once again. When the Supreme Court says something is a serious matter, that is obiter. It is a useless statement for practical purposes. Nothing can be done about a statement where the Supreme Court says this is a serious matter. So what? What can be done about a statement of the Supreme Court is where the Supreme Court says something is unconstitutional or void. It immediately means that that thing as a matter of law should not exist. The Supreme Court had said and in 2014, legally in 2014 that these cards are unconstitutional. Exactly. And the same Supreme Court has said in 2016, as they are entitled to do under our Constitution, Article 1293, that they are now voidable. In okay, other so words, by saying that they are as now we say voidable, in Ghana, 
by the saying Supreme that they are now voidable. The Supreme Court is entitled to change its mouth. But by saying that, by your position that they are now voidable, mm -hmm. you mean that a step ought to be taken to render them, you know, as it, as it were void because they are voidable. Exactly. So a step ought to be taken. Through and, legal and processes. And as far as you are concerned, uh -huh. what is the step? Good. So if today you, you discover or know that somebody is on the register mm -hmm. and should not be on the register. You go and make a complaint. You have to use the legal processes available CI for getting those names through the exhibition. Off. The first method mm. is through CI 91. Okay. Okay. Where you know there are district uh, complaint committees right. which are set up for this process. Mm. Okay. The only Tony legal case, legal point in this judgment, is actually a matter that no one has raised so far. The only thing that can be said to be a little unclear mm. in the case is something that I haven't heard I wanted you to end anywhere. on that point. Okay. You're saying that as far as you're concerned, mm. the court says these are voidable. Mm -hmm. They are not void. If it said they are void, it means they did not exist at all. It means that the register today right. must be read to Correct. exclude Now, if all it says names. they are voidable, mm -hmm. then it means some steps have to be taken. Exactly. And that is why it asks the EC to use processes established under law exactly. to clean. That's exactly. your understanding. And that is why the and orders you say are not automatic. The only, and you say the only process mm -hmm. available now, conceivable, is CI 91 through the challenge procedure, uh, through the exhibition process, correct? But that procedure entails two things. Mm. A process initiated by a voter and a process initiated swap by the Electoral Commission itself. So that means that mm -hmm. if nobody went to the EC to raise a challenge, mm -hmm. persons who registered with NHIS cards, mm -hmm. whose registration have been declared unconstitutional, mm -hmm. whose presence, continued presence on the register, renders the register not reasonably accurate and credible mm -hmm. will still remain because no challenge has been raised. That's not true. CI 91 provides for a mechanism where the Electoral Commission itself can clean the register. The Electoral Commission issues a statement those, and says those, uh, that names. it cannot unilaterally do those deletions. CI 91 is clear. No, but the Electoral Commission statement. No. If I could read it to you, that's their statement. The Electoral See, Commission again, statement. Mm. Something. Right. The way in which the media interprets statements mm. is problematic. Okay. Okay. I was outstanding yesterday mm. when I saw all the newspapers, Daily Graphic, Times, Daily Guide, Statesman, attributing to Justice Do Doce. What he did not say. We'll end on that, Justice Doche. So, so ju just hold on with Justice Doche. I, I, I don't Justice want to take Duche. this interpretation yes, of just, the... Just, just wait. We'll end on Justice Doche. But the EC's statement that it issued said, among other things, that um, the, the, the EC cannot unilaterally, these are its words, it cannot mm. unilaterally mm -hmm. delete the names. You are saying there's a process in the EC's, uh, in, in CI 47, mm -hmm. uh, uh, 91, that allows the EC to do the deletions. But, Samson, the EC cannot unilaterally delete names because CI 91 has a procedure where the person whose name is about to be deleted can protect his right to vote. To the extent that that process in, uh, exists, the process is not unilateral. By unilateral, it means the EC on its own takes the register and says, oh, I don't like your black face, off. I don't like your red face, off. That's unilateral. The EC didn't end there. It says that it cannot do it unilaterally. Mm -hmm. The only way it can do it is mm -hmm. said, 
the law requires that an objection is made mm -hmm. during the exhibition process, mm -hmm. either by a registered voter mm -hmm. or an official of the commission. Exactly. That's what I've been saying at the, from the beginning, that there are two mechanisms. Either a voter comes and says, I object to this name because this person is dead. Mm. Or an EC official says, and that is why my advice to the EC is to send out a notice saying to the people of Ghana, if you have information about the names of people who shouldn't be on the register, including NHIA registrants, bring them. And even if you as an individual cannot go through the procedure for deleting them, we as the Electoral Commission will what? Do it. Because so your understanding is, is that the mm -hmm. order to the EC mm -hmm. is delete NHIS card holders, mm -hmm. including others, but delete them through the exhibition, the challenge process. Delete them according to law. Right. And according to law is the exhibition process, the challenge process. According to law is the process in CI 91. And which is what I'm referring to. Exactly. Now, do, do we pay attention? How, however. Do we pay attention? However. To, yes. Remember that the Supreme Court has the power to strike down legislation mm -hmm. as unconstitutional. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. The only outstanding legal issue in the Abu Ramadan case is whether there is any part of the Supreme Court judgment that impliedly strikes down a part of, of CI 91. 91. You understand what I'm saying? You're a lawyer, so what you get you it. So what do you think? That's the only outstanding issue. What do you think? I think that if the EC uses the process in CI 91, mm. and that process is unable to catch all the persons who make the current register unclean, then that process is impliedly changed to the extent of the Abu Ramadan judgment. Okay, now I wanted you to pay attention to this. Mm -hmm. In pages 20 and 21 of the July 2014 judgment, mm -hmm. the EC suggested that it could rely on the challenge process mechanism mm -hmm. to clean the register. Mm -hmm. This is what the, the court said, mm -hmm. and this is Her Ladyship, the Chief Justice. An unhealthy reliance on the challenge and complaints tier is bound to generate chaos, confusion, and anarchy at registration and polling centers. It does not promote excellence in work ethic, and same ought to be rejected. It dignifies mediocrity, which certainly is not a value that we in this court should endorse nor promote. Do you still say the court expects the EC to use this process? Yes, because the judgment you are reading from was discussing CI 75. Yes. This current judgment is relying on CI 91. It was discussing seven, CI 72, CI but, 72 yes. but it mm -hmm. was discussing the uh, exhibition process, the no. challenge process. Look the, same, the same provisions remain in, the, in CI no, 90, 91. They have been they, they've been expanded and changed. Look, there's a difference between the procedure in CI 72 mm. and the procedure in CI 91. No, but the substantive issue is the challenge procedure. Yes, but the challenge procedure has not changed. The procedure in CI 91, mm -hmm. if executed to the letter, can satisfy the judgment of the Supreme Court. As far as the two routes are used, the route where an ordinary voter comes to make a challenge. challenge and the route where EC officials, so sponte, make the challenge. So that if, it, go if eventually the nobody makes a challenge, there will not be deletion? No. If nobody makes a challenge, EC officials can make the challenge. But you said that persons must bring that to the attention of the EC officials. No. I'm just saying that I'm giving unsolicited advice mm. to the Electoral Commission that they should issue an mm. announcement right. asking people submit whatever evidence they have. You're saying that it is wrong for the EC to get up today mm -hmm. and do their deletions and publish the names of those who have been deleted and ask them to come 
and show why you should be re-registered. The EC that, that is not the use, order of the court. That's not the order of the court. The order of the court is that they should do it according to law. And the law we have here are two. The order of the court is not do it according to law. The order of the court is do it, it says mm -hmm. delete or clean Samson. the current register Samson. to bring it in compliance there's, with, there's with the constitution an, and applicable law. An, that's what I just bring said. Bring it in compliance, not according to do the every, process according to law. Every order of a court mm. is presumed to mean mm. that that order should be carried out legally because the court of law is presumed to act according to law. What, what, so what, 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 what does the, the aside order that, of the Supreme Court constitute? Aside that, when, the, when the Supreme Court orders you, what does it constitute? Does it constitute law requiring you to, to act or refrain from acting or about something? Uh, that's not a very clear question. There are okay. different instances where mm. that applies. Okay, I'm asking that because, mm -hmm. and uh, we're just uh, uh, going to round up. I'm asking that because the, the order was that the Electoral Commission takes, immediate, takes steps immediately mm -hmm. to delete, or as is popularly known, clean the current register of voters to comply with the provisions of the 1992 Constitution and applicable law. Then it went further to say so, that any person whose name is deleted from the register mm -hmm. uh, of voters by the Electoral Commission, person to the order, order, the order above, that is yes. A, mm -hmm. should be given the opportunity to register. Yeah, but Samson, we are not in disagreement here. The Supreme mm. Court says clearly mm. that the Electoral Commission should clean the register right. according to the constitutional and legal provisions existing in Ghana today. No, clean it so that mm -hmm. it will become in accordance with the constitution and the, and the law. Yes. Uh -huh. And what I'm saying is that if you clean that register, other than in the manner provided by law, mm. you will be acting illegally. Okay. And the EC cannot act illegally. I see. Yes. So as far as you're concerned, the, the, EC, order, the order is that clean it, and the cleaning has to be done only through the... Um, exhibition process. No. That's the position of the no, EC. No, no, no. It depends on what you mean by exhibition. The challenge CI, process. Exactly. Mm. So let's be clear the terms we use mm. because they have grave implications. Okay. The EC, the Supreme Court said, do the cleaning of the reg mm -hmm. register according to law. And by law here, we mean the that, that is in the judgment. I'm referring to the orders. The yes. orders didn't say do it, do it according according to established law. The order said do it so that the register will become compliant with the constitution and applicable laws. How else can the EC mm. clean a register other than in accordance with law? Was there good reason the court asked the EC whether it has a database of those to be deleted in court? And the EC answered in the affirmative that yes, we know we know these people. And uh, was it yes, the basis? Because the courts normally don't want to issue what they call brute infulment. They don't want to issue an order that, that cannot, cannot be, be obeyed. Okay. So they wanted to find out whether the orders they may make Can are capable mm. of being enforced. So if I ask you, do you mm -hmm. know the the people? You, you want to delete, we, they, we, we want to ask you to delete, mm -hmm. and you say, I know them. Mm -hmm. Do you think that my order will require you further to go through a challenge process to get them deleted? Yes. You see, if I ask you whether or not you can identify people who may be removed, mm -hmm. I'm not asking you to go and remove them, and I'm not asking you to go and remove them illegally. Okay, and also the Supreme Court's uh, mm -hmm. order that do this immediately, you think accommodates the EC's own calendar as it is it wants to do? Because it said do it immediately. Yes, immediately is subject to interpretation. In other words, it means do it within a reasonable time. And what is reasonable depends on the exigencies of the, the period. If you ask someone to do something immediately in a register that has two million voters, right. the time frame <coughs> will be different from asking someone to do it in a register that Since has 20 million voters. Since the EC was already doing this, mm -hmm. then this order was, was needless, was useless. No, it's not useless. Because the EC was Where already doing this. There's a difference between mm. somebody doing something mm. because they feel that they are obliged to do it. Okay. 
and somebody doing it because they are actually ordered and obliged to do it. It's a difference. If the EC is doing it or his own, then at some point they can't stop, mm -hmm. right? But okay. if the court says do it, <laughs> then they can't stop. Okay. Well, now, just uh, quickly, we are, we, are, we are rounding up now. Mm -hmm. Tell me, Justice Jose, what he said, mm -hmm. and you have already hinted that it appears that there was a misinterpretation of what he said. Um, does what he said, like some report, does it not sort of end the matter somehow? Um, there are two aspects mm. to the Justice Doce saga. The first is whether he should have spoken at all. And the second is, what did he actually say? Mm. Okay. Um, if you look at the code of conduct for magistrates and judges, the, the one signed by the Chief mm. Justice in 2011, right. It provides that a, a judge may give public lectures, do tuition, workshops. They call them avocational activities. Mm. And they are permitted to do that as long as it's within the law. So Justice Doshi was within his right uh, when he went to teach magistrates on electoral laws. Okay. But if you read further down to page 13, um, the code is very clear that you shouldn't make statements about cases to journalists. Now, if the person to whom he spoke... Does the code actually say that? Yes, I can read it to you. Um, <coughs> sorry, but we need to clear this. So it goes. says, quote, speaking yeah. to a journalist is public comment, mm -hmm. even where it is agreed that the statements are off record. And that's this a, can be found in rule, um, mm. uh, sub rule nine of the, sub rule nine of rule three mm. of the code of conduct. Okay. So there he went wrong. Okay. The, co the, 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 the code says, mm -hmm. uh, Rule 3 9 mm -hmm. says that except as otherwise provided in this section, mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, so section 3 9, except as otherwise provided in this section, a judge shall abstain from public comment about a pending or impending proceedings in court, mm -hmm. in any court, mm -hmm. and shall require similar abstention on the part of court personnel. Then, A, a judge is permitted to make public statements in the course of his or her official duties, mm -hmm. or to explain for public information the procedures of the court, general legal principles, or what may be learned from the public record in a case. Yeah, but you have to go down to the part which says that. That's the explanation. So the first part says, don't make public comment. Yes, yeah, there's an exception. And then down there, it says, speaking to a journalist is public comment. So there's no way you can say that you can speak to a journalist and still be, be within the room. I'm reading here. Mm -hmm. A judge is permitted to make public statements. Mm -hmm. Permitted to make public statements. Again, Samson, let's be careful. A public statement is different from public comment. In, in legal analysis, you have to watch the words. The rule says, don't make public comment. Mm. And if you speak to a journalist, even mm. off record, mm. that is public comment. All right. So you can't make a public comment. But you can make a public statement. What <laughs> Justice Richard did was a public comment. Very and he shouldn't have. It's very interesting. The sad um, part is that the journalists and all the newspapers misinterpreted what he said. First, he says, I am not interpreting the judgment. So I don't know where the media has gone in Ghana today. Okay. The man says, I'm not interpreting the statement. And then the next day, all the newspapers say, Justice Duce has interpreted the, the, the judgment. But you are saying you wish he how, hadn't commented at all. How did we all. arrive at that right. in this country? Okay. Well, yeah. um, too bad time has run out okay. of us on, in a way that I can't understand. Yeah. Um, but thank you very much for the opportunity uh, for coming to the studio. Um, yeah. what, what, what would be your advice? You are saying you're going to give an advice. What would be your advice? to go forward with this and to avoid the, the implications for the validity of the election, which you mentioned, mm -hmm. and for any challenge after the election? Yes. So my advice is that the Electoral Commission should continue what it has started. It has issued a statement, given an understanding of the judgment, mm. 
it needs to go further and specifically request people who know, who have evidence of the extent of unreliability of our register to submit that evidence. When it is submitted, they should not use only the route which involves a voter contesting through the complaints committee because that is ardors and not many people have the time and energy and money to do that. Whatever evidence they have, they should allow their own officers to additionally make those challenges. That will get us to a more credible register, that aspiration of a more credible register. Since he has the list of the, he says he has a list of these people, he doesn't need all of them. He should just go ahead and clear them Again, off. Again, let's be careful. The Supreme Court didn't say that it has the list. I was in court that day. They were asked whether they could identify. But they say you exactly. can't. So why should the they wait words, for any process to do that? The words are important. Okay, thank if you. If I say thank you very I can much, identify, <laughs> it's different from thank I you. have the list. Thank you very much. I've okay. been speaking to uh, Dr. Raymond Atuguba. Uh, thank you very much. He's a senior lecturer at the University of Ghana uh, Law School, and he holds uh, some very, very uh, interesting opinions that differ from what you may have heard generally on the, on the Abu Ramadan case uh, and its uh, judgment. Thank you. Take a quick break here. We'll be right back. <laughs>